coffee with with, with coffee, 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 coffee. Good afternoon and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with Toffees. We've got the starting soon screen up for you because, uh, well, quite frankly, I haven't pulled up a picture that I am happy with to show you just yet on the main screen. Uh, we don't have any guests today, so it's just me talking about the international and what happened there. And uh, it's going to be a pretty simple show. I don't have a ton planned. I, a lot of folks have asked me to kind of talk about my experiences um, on site and sort of what went on there. And uh, that's what we're going to do. So. Uh, without further ado, let's start off by saying a big shout out to our sponsors, obviously Razor and Betway.com, who uh, do sponsor the show and make it possible to continue to do the quality of product that uh, we've been able to put out and will continue to put out. It's you know obviously been my goal for a long time to make sure that the stuff that is coming out uh, of this program is high enough quality that you guys really feel like you're, you want to be here, you want to hang out with us, and I feel like uh, the sponsors have gone a long way towards making that doable. So a big shout out to them, a big thank you. Uh, and Without further ado, let's talk about TI. Now this may be a little bit free form. I mean, I will be a little bit free form. It's going to be kind of a flow of consciousness to a certain extent, as I'm going to just take you through what TI was like for me, sort of the experiences I had there, etc. And if you guys, of course, have uh, any questions in Twitch chat, if you're hanging out, feel free to ask. I'm going to try to keep up with Twitch chat as we do the show. Uh, today especially so that we can kind of answer questions and so on and so forth so let's start out with uh, talking about the event and the start you know we flew in uh, Sunday night I got there and Sunday I got to kind of hang out register at my hostel uh, get comfortable and get settled in for the event and uh, I should first say that <laughs> I booked late because of the situation uh, with Valve I thought for sure that they'd be interested in um, contracting a morning show they weren't it was not did not happen foolish me for hoping for it uh, that said I booked everything late so it was a little more expensive uh, but Frontier Airlines actually surprised me with the quality of their service I had no issues um, it was very smooth it was very very clean and uh, I, I actually really recommend it I think that I usually fly Delta and everybody seemed to have tons of problems with Delta after TI Frontier was completely flawless so I guess consider that next time around uh, my hostel was great I did an Airbnb I thought it was gonna be super creepy um, and it was the first day but I eventually I realized that it wasn't that bad like I walked into this hostel it was just some dude's house. One of his bedrooms had four bunks, and one of his bedrooms was a private room. I got the private room, um, and the guys living in the four bunks were really just some laid-back people. It was like a Skype programmer, uh, a dude named Sven, who is a fan from Sweden. He's like six foot six, long blonde hair, super Adonis. Like if you put a Sven cosplay on the dude, you would freak. I, I would have freaked out. I've been like, this is what Sven is in real life. Um, we had a Chinese fan. He didn't speak a lot of English, but he was uh, he was literally just there to watch Dota. And my favorite thing is he wore a neck pillow to and from the stadium every day. And I asked him why, and he said, when you watch much Dota, your neck gets very tired. And like that's how committed that guy was to Dota. Is he literally just went every day, whether it was a six hour day or a twelve hour day. And and just laid in the chair with his neck pillow and watched unending amounts of Dota and I absolutely absolutely loved it so uh, that was pretty cool very very neat place to stay it ended up being very reasonably priced so I was pretty happy about that uh, Monday rolls around and the event starts I got there early I got my will call ticket um, it was really really cool though <laughs> I had a bit of a situation come up. So to talk about why I was there, one of the things that came up during the process was I was really worried that I wouldn't be able to attend TI because uh, it was expensive, a lot more expensive than I expected. And uh, 2P, Dota, the website, the new site, heard that I was struggling to pay the bills, so they contacted me and said, hey, if we cover the cost of your hotel and your flight, would you be willing to do your YouTube videos and instead of putting them on your site like you normally would, can you put them on our site instead? I said, absolutely. So that's a great deal for me. Um, normally they would have gone on my site. I, they probably would have got more hits than I think we got over there uh, because my site's got a little more uh, curb appeal, I guess, or is a little better known. That said, we posted them there. They helped pay the bills. Thanks to 2P for doing that for me. Um, I know that we've had some back and forth here on the show with them sponsoring and not and maybe uh, et cetera, but I was really happy with working with them. They did a great job. 
So uh, Tupac made it possible for me to get there, and I'm planning all these interviews and all this cool stuff that I've got to do. And I told him, hey, I am going to get you at least two interviews uh, a day. That's my goal, two interviews a day. So Monday rolls around, and I head out, and I'm like, let's do this thing. It's going to be tons of fun. And I had cut my finger um, probably about five days before TI, and it had started to get a little bit infected. So I went to the doctor. He gave me some antibiotics. He said, it'll be fine by the time you fly out. No big deal. Apparently, that's not what happened because the flight or something about the air pressure caused my, my finger to just swell up. So I pulled up a picture. I'll show you guys of what it looked like when it was full size. So you can maybe see that. I don't know if I want to zoom in because it's pretty gross. So it got to be about that size. Now that was Monday morning as I went in to start doing my videos. Um, and I, you know, I called the doctor and he's like, you need to go see an urgent care or something like that, get it taken care of. So uh, I decided that I should do that, but I want to make sure I get my interviews in first. So I did, I went out, I got the uh, Wind Ranger interview that a lot of folks saw, uh, and a couple of other backups, some fan interviews, some things like that, um, and thought that, hey, this will be great. The problem is, and <laughs> this is crazy to me, in the time that it took me to get the interviews, so it's about one or two o'clock at this point, my hand is getting really sore. So I look down at it as I wrap up my interviews, and there was literally um, a red line running from my pinky all the way up to about here on my arm and on the back it was tender and red all the way up to about here so <laughs> i am um, absolutely <laughs> was like i think i'm done with interviews for the day i managed to get four so i filled my quota went over to the surgery um, they actually did a surgery in the office it took about an hour and a half they shot me full of some sort of like medication to numb it my entire arm was numb for about an hour uh, and they cut it open and, and did the whole thing so now it sort of looks like this which is still pretty disgusting. I don't know if you can actually see it on the thing. There you go. So it's still pretty busted up. We won't hold it too long because it's pretty bad. Um, but I was able to go back, had a bandage on, uh, which led to all kinds of quality jokes on YouTube and other comments. Uh, but I think ultimately uh, it was good that we got taken care of. But I want you to know that's how committed I am to getting interviews. So that was kind of a weird thing to have happen on the first day. Now, Taking it back from this sort of linear time frame, um, I want to talk about the experience of sort of getting to the arena, and it was amazing. This is my first TI, never seen anything like it. The whole, the fact that the whole plaza was sort of bought out for TI stuff, um, the place for the secret shop in a different building, the outdoor viewing area, key arena was just so surreal, so, so neat. I mean, I go to NFL games, I've gone to EPL games, I love traditional sports, and it just blew my mind to see how amazing this event was was um so it's pretty great it, it was super awesome super inspiring until i got to the press area now i got a press pass and i think that that was a really cool feature you know one of the benefits of working with 2p but i walked into the press room and this is a part of the of the vlog where we can talk about a serious valve oversight valve got this arena and i think what they did is currently the wnba team plays there now the WNBA team isn't that popular. It's not very big. So I think what they thought they'd do is just give us the press resources that they normally give to the WNBA team, which would make sense if we were, say, a local TV station or a small group of uh, press, but it wasn't. It was all the press from the internationals group, so everybody was there. We walk into the press room, and there's four plastic fold-out tables set up around the room um, and some Ethernet cords. And that's the only room we have to like store our stuff, put our equipment, set up our uploads, do our edits. Uh, and that was pretty brutal, I'm not gonna lie. That was really, really badly planned in part by Valve. Um, so that was incredibly frustrating, to be honest. Uh, and then the second thing that was really hard is they set up two rooms downstairs with the international backdrops for interviews. They looked gorgeous, but they didn't put any lights in them. So if you were a major studio like Al Jazeera when they came out, or one of the big Chinese groups that brought lots of lights with them, not a big deal, that's really optimal. But Dota sort of revolves around these sort of micro communities and these small content creators who aren't going to be able to afford to bring thousands of dollars worth of lighting. And that was kind of hard that we weren't able to use any of those resources because we didn't have the cash to light those. It would have been nice to have a room for small content creators with like preset lighting and some other stuff, and then maybe a second room for the bigger studios to use during their interviews. But that said, um, it was nice that we had that in the first place. We had our own entrance, which was nice. And uh, I will say this, they also put out, you probably saw them if you were at TI, if you didn't, they had desks out uh, in the actual stadium where you could sit to watch games. Now, 
it was very nice. It was separated. You had to have a press pass to get in there. It had electricity and Ethernet hookups, so we were ahead of the game. The problem we run into is they were designed to watch an hour and a half basketball game. They're incredibly uncomfortable to sit at. The biggest issue is I'm so for instance, I'm six three and a lot of the other writers are, are pretty big guys. And for an hour and a half, it was bearable. But for 12 hours to sit under that desk while working was literally almost impossible. So my heart goes out to writers like Gorgon um, or like Durka and Malastrix, who are, who are pretty much always sitting there putting work in or writing. Um, that they, I think that I think that their legs and their backs should be a mess after this thing because there was no comfortable place. Uh, you know, I, I appreciated the VIP upgrades that they gave at random to people who bought tickets. So that was a really cool thing to do. But I think it would have been very, very nice if they had just set up one section of the upper deck for press, made a viewing area that was a little more functional with our tables up there, uh, something a little more comfortable as well for us to sort of embed and create better content. And the, a lot of folks said, well, they don't want you around the players. And I get that. I don't want to bother players. I only interviewed one player the entire time. I wanted to let them focus on what they were doing. Um, and it would be simple to say block off the entrances to the player section and just allow press that one area. Uh, and that was, I think, my biggest problem with the tournament was the fact that press, especially small press, was a huge afterthought. And that was kind of a struggle to deal with. But getting off of that soapbox, everything else was amazing. They did provide us with some food and some drinks, uh, you know, snacks like Cheez-Its and things like that, which, as crazy as it sounds, did help me a lot because I eat Cheez-Its. <laughs> I mean, I eat Cheez-Its and stuff for lunch every day because I couldn't afford to really get big lunches. Um, so it was helpful in that capacity. They did give us some things. So thank you, Val. Um, so that's enough of that soapbox. Let's talk about the event, the idea. So I mentioned the outdoor seating area. And somebody brought it up over in chat that it was really, really cool because people could watch without tickets. The seating area was literally because Valve said, hey, if you come in, we want you to have a place to hang out as part of the community and watch Dota. And honestly, it was a really great place to watch. I watched a lot of games out there, even though I did have tickets, because it was really, really relaxing and a lot of fun to sort of just hang out there um, and be comfortable. So definitely kudos to them on setting that up. It was a very expensive. Uh, I can guarantee it. The screen quality was incredible. So I think that that was a really neat feature that they gave. Um, the rest of the tournament, I mean, it was really good. Like, I think that you guys watch it. I'm sure you watch it. If you didn't, you're crazy. One of the best TIs I've seen. Uh, almost all of the games were good. Everything was a blast to watch. The only thing was, obviously, the first couple of days were long. And TI has this weird vibe to it. It's like... The first three days, you're going home, you're just exhausted and you're tired and you're like, holy cow, this thing's never going to end. And you're having fun, but you're just completely drained. And then all of a sudden you turn this corner and you're like, holy cow, there's only two days left, what now? And I definitely felt that burnout around day two or three. Um, in fact, there was one day where uh, Prove and I, we worked really hard on Wednesday and got a lot of videos made so that we could actually take Thursday to ourselves um, because we were just burning out with all the running around and stuff that we were doing. And I think that it was the right way to do it. Uh, I think might have hurt some video push out a little bit, but it was definitely uh, good for a rest. Now, the interviews that we did, I don't know if you guys got to see them all. If you didn't, they're on the 2P Dota uh, YouTube. You can just look up 2P Dota. It's all right there. Uh, the one that was the most popular was this Wind Ranger video about a Wind Ranger who got kicked out of the stadium because of her bow and some issues with it. Um, I thought it would be a good story. It wasn't player-centric. It was something that nobody else was covering. And uh, it seemed to play really, really well. So I was happy about that. And I was happy because throughout the week, I actually met other cosplayers at the event who would say things to me like, oh, yeah, Monday and Tuesday, they really gave us a hard time about getting in here. They took our weapons. They wouldn't allow us in. Uh, and by Wednesday and Thursday, the policy had changed, actually. So I think that I don't want to take credit for it completely, but I think that the story definitely helped draw some eyes to the fact that it needed to be readdressed. Um, and I think that it was. And because I did talk to a Jaw Ranger on Wednesday or Thursday who had a massive weapon and said, you know, they, they hassled me initially, but um, about on Wednesday they stopped. And that was a really good, I think, thing to have happen. So uh, I'm glad that that came out. I'm glad that we got a little bit of attention sent to it. So um, that was great. Other interviews that we did that I thought were really strong, uh, we had the Al Jazeera piece. If you didn't see that, you should definitely check it out. Uh, so Al Jazeera, the TV station, is, I would say, the fourth largest news network in the country. We have Fox News, CNN, uh, MSN, and then sort of Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera was there. Um, in fact, <laughs> funny story. So I was actually in the basement, uh, in the press room, talking with a bunch of other content creators and press about 
sponsorships and s trying to take a show full time. And I said that it's all, it's almost impossible right now because media doesn't or advertising doesn't understand the situation that consumers are in at the moment. They want to throw thousands and thousands of dollars at TV shows um, on traditional networks that maybe get a couple thousand viewers in the middle of the night and are wide band branding. So maybe you get 60,000, maybe you get 20, 30,000 watchers and you don't have any demographic focus on them or it's a very wide demographic focus and they pay a lot of money for that. I said it's incredible that advertisers are not putting more money into internet marketing. Our show for instance, between podcast and YouTube and everything else hits about 60,000 viewers a month. That's pretty decent. And when I go to sponsors, and I'll be honest with you guys, in the past, for sponsors to put their banner on, to be mentioned at the start and the end of every show, and to be involved with the process, I ask them, and this is full disclosure because I'm always open with you guys, for about $300 for the month. Now, I think that that's a pretty fair deal, considering the amount of viewers. Um, it also allows me to, say, do things like get the chroma key and expand the show, so it's very helpful. Um, and I get, I get really bad responses on that. They say things like, well, the ROI is good, that's return on investment, but it's just not enough money for us to worry about. Um, in fact, I had one sponsor tell me that had I come forward and asked them for 1,000 instead of 300, they would have been more likely to say yes, because at least it would have made them feel like they were getting something bigger. I don't know, it was just a really weird conversation. So in the middle of this sort of rage about where brands are spending money, uh, I went on a tirade about how TV is a dead media or it's a dying media. Print is dead. TV is dying. The internet is the future. And as I said that, these guys walk in with all this cool equipment and they go, well, we're TV. And I'm like, yeah, and who are you? And they go, Al Jazeera America. And I went, hello, it's nice to meet you. And I introduced myself and chat with them a little bit. They were actually really cool about walking in during the tirade. Um, and uh, they started chatting with me. They were saying, well, your business perspective is unique. Like, let's chat about sort of what it takes. And I said, well, I'm a content creator and I'm trying to survive and this is sort of the situation we find ourselves in. And we chatted and they said, well, can you give us a tour, kind of tell us a little about Dota. So we chatted for a while. Um, and at the end of it, he goes, well, I'd really like to interview you. Can we interview for Al Jazeera America to talk about the business side of things? And I said, well, I'm probably not the best about that. You know, I can get you in touch with LD from Join Dota or Toby Wan. Uh, so LD from BTS or Toby Wan from Join Dota. Or I said, uh, Shiva would, would be a great person to talk to. She sort of built herself from the ground up. There's a lot of good professionals here who can give you insight. And he said, well, I want to understand the business of content creation. So we did chat. Um, but what I did tell him was, I'll make you a deal. I will do an interview with you and you can interview me for your TV show. But I get five minutes afterwards where I can interview you about how the mainstream media sees Dota. And he said that was a deal. And uh, I think that's, that is, it actually played really well. I enjoyed the interview immensely. I think that it was covered well. Reddit seemed to enjoy it. Um, and it's a good perspective of sort of what mainstream thinks about us when they sort of send reporters out there. Um, the fact that the producers had to fight to get somebody on site, uh, I think speaks volumes for where we're on our way to, but not quite where we are first. So. Definitely check that one out. And then, of course, uh, I was really excited because uh, they did all this Al Jazeera fil filming stuff. And uh, they did talk to Shiva. They talked to some other folks as well as Casey. Atchison, she was on the interview list as well. And apparently, I'm the only one who made the cut in the big show. So uh, I got my five minutes of fame on Al Jazeera's evening news. Yay me, I suppose. Uh, my only hope is that it played well. I also had a chance to interview uh, with... Uh, Vice, a Canadian, I guess it's like a, it's a website that does, I don't know, BuzzFeed type crap. And then apparently they might be launching a TV station or show. Uh, so we did an interview for that. So we'll see if that comes out or not. But I did get to do a lot of fun stuff while I was there regarding media that I thought was very interesting. Um, I got to meet a lot of folks I never met before. I got to meet pretty much everybody who uh, was who is involved with Dota that I haven't met yet. So that was a lot of fun. Very, very cool. Got to hang out with the BTS and the JD guys and just see a lot of uh, different folks that I haven't had a chance to connect with. Um, I didn't get to meet Bruno, which was a lot of fun. Uh, he was sort of sitting. You guys didn't get to see it, but every time that the panel was on at TI, Bruno was sitting off screen, sort of just watching them. So uh, he was like the overlord. And I think my favorite moment was I went up to Bruno. I said, hey, Bruno, I just want to introduce myself to you, Toffees. And he goes, oh, I know you, Toffees. He said, you, uh, we, re he, what did he say? He said, uh, that TI selection show was great. And he did this weird thing where he like changed his tone. He goes, that TI selection show was great. We were watching. 
And I was like, whoa, whoa. What, what, did we have to make the change? Did we have to get all Valve Mafioso on me? Uh, that said, though, it was very, very cool to uh, meet him, chat with him, and also to hear that Valve in general, or some people at Valve, I guess, uh, were aware of the show. So that was that was a pretty exciting moment for me. I'm not going to lie. Lots of hype um, from that. So woohoo! at least Valve pays attention. I think that's all we can ask. So that was sort of uh, the start of the thing, and then just the rest of the the rest of the week was running around, getting interviews, meeting cosplayers, uh, taking pictures. Now there was this weird thing that happened, and it happened all week long, and I can't explain it because it was so surreal and it made no sense in my head. And that is that I signed autographs. I I honestly can't explain to you. Uh, how cool it was, but also how completely off guard I was that people would even ask for an autograph. I was unprepared for this, uh, but it was a really cool thing to to do, if that makes sense. I, I don't know how else to explain it. So if you're somebody who asked for my autograph, yeah, thank you for making me feel awesome. Um, and if you're somebody who was too scared to ask for my autograph, I guess thank you for making me feel awesome. Um, but literally walking around and having people stop me in the in the in the concourse and this happened a lot and not even ask for autographs just shake my hand and say toffees i really enjoyed the show i i love listening you make my workouts bearable uh i listen every week like was incredibly helpful incredibly meaningful i i'll be honest with you like i don't make a fortune doing this um if anything there's some months where we make nothing there's some months where i make enough uh to cover the bills and there's some that i i make enough that hey i can buy a video game or update my compendium um and having people say that and stop me and really sort of express gratitude for the show was incredibly meaningful and incredibly encouraging. So if you are one of those folks who stopped me, um, I thank you so much for that. It, it, it really meant the world to me. And if you didn't, uh, whether you were too busy or you just were like, I don't want to bother Toffees, uh, you know, if you even thought about it, I really appreciate it. it. It definitely gave me the motivation to come back and continue doing what I'm doing. Um, and putting out this content, which I hope will only improve. We've got content plans, and I was going to talk about it later, but I'll just talk about it now. Um, the show's coming back full force. We're probably going to do two shows a week because uh, I think three is – there was just a lot to maintain there. Um, what we will definitely keep going is the Friday wrap-ups, obviously the big summaries for folks so you can listen while you're working out or something like that. And then we'll probably try to get an interview show at least once a week and then maybe add in some panel shows as necessary. So if a big shuffle or a big trade happens, then we'll have a special edition Coffee with Toffees. Um, I think that's a lot more maintainable with the, with the way that things are. Second, we're working on a show. I've got some overlay artists, uh, or I'm working against overlay artists involved with creating the graphics and stuff for it. Um, and that'll probably be bi-monthly, and it's going to be a, about escaping the trench, talking to pros, uh, getting opinions and practices to improve your play. And I think that that'll be a lot of fun. So check that one out. Uh, and I've got a couple more in the pipeline that I'm working on over the next couple of months, but I'm not jumping into too quickly since obviously uh, launching a new show is going to have to be in the same quality as the show that we already run, uh, and that takes some time and money. So it's going to be little by little. Also, uh, we'll be covering all of the shakeups, all of the shifts. I can guarantee you this, boys and girls, you are in for a wild ride until for the next month. September is going to roll around. The rosters are going to lock, but for the next 20 or so days, we're going to see some crazy stuff going down. So this is the first time we've had roster locks in place. Um, if any of you watch football, or I mean, uh, soccer, football, if you're not from America, uh, they have these trade windows that result in hard stop times. And it is incredible how much action goes on in that last week. So I'm really excited about seeing like that last week, that last trade day, uh, what happens before rosters lock in. Because those rosters have to be in by that day in September in order for teams to play in the first major. So it's going to be a really, really big deal. So uh, we will be having, uh, Hefla brought it up in chat, we'll be having announcements in the first week or two. Uh, we probably, I think we'll be having them even faster than that. We already know some of the players who are negotiating new contracts. Um, I'm not at liberty to talk about them at the moment. We also know that the money is going to be significantly larger than we've ever seen before. Transparency is something that's important to players now. So we have a lot of things that are changing. Uh, the landscape is shifting. If you ever thought you should create an agency or a player agency or a talent agency, now's probably the time to get involved with that uh, you might be a little bit late actually but for the next round um, so I'm excited about the next couple of weeks in Dota and then obviously everything going on after that so that's gonna be a lot of fun uh, let's talk about the event and surprises for me oh my goodness CDEC was 
so much fun to watch. Those guys, man. Death Ball of Doom and uh, EG Hill with the answer. I didn't know if they'd be able to pull it off because of the first set of games, but they did. And uh, it was pretty crazy to see a team that most folks wrote off and didn't think was going to matter come out and absolutely crush everyone. That was... That was absolutely fabulous and a lot of fun to watch. I also want to say that I think the crowd was really good this year in the sense of it didn't feel like an East-West. It didn't feel like TI3. Everybody was like, well, we got to beat the Chinese. It really felt like everyone just wanted to watch good Dota. And uh, it was a lot of fun because of that. Until the final. Once the final came about, the stadium was split, man. If you were in section 124 or 121, you did not like Evil Geniuses. If you were anywhere else in the stadium, you went crazy when they played well. Uh, and that was also super fun to watch. So that was sort of TI, I think, in a nutshell. It was chaotic. It was crazy. It was fun. I got scored a uh, pass to the after party. Thank you to Beef uh, from Complexity for coming up with that, uh, which was a lot of fun. Free food, free drinks, more ways for me to save money while I was out there, which was good. Uh, it did feel weird to have Dead Mouse playing. So let me say this. I enjoy Dead Mouse, and I enjoy EDM. I actually go to Hakkasan in Vegas when I'm there. I like to watch house concerts. I think they're pretty entertaining. But, and, and you know what, I even thought he fit at the after party a lot, or not the after party, the uh, post game. I think a lot of folks didn't get it because the production staff didn't do a good job of sort of showing the uh, montage, if you will, at the same time. I think had, had Dead Mouse started to play, had he done a song or two, and then they had cut to a stream of the montage with uh, Dead Mouse doing a live in the background, that would have played well. The fact that it didn't do it that way didn't really play that great, and, and I get why Twitch got angry. I also was super confused at the a at the after party, and it was sort of like Valve was showing off, right? Because Dead Mouse is a guy who sells out stadiums. He travels the world. People go crazy for him, and here he is at this uh, small venue playing a concert for what had to have been no more than 400 people, uh, most of whom didn't even watch, and it, I mean, that can't have been cheap. So I think Valve was being like, yeah, no, we've got cash. You know, we've got Dead Mouse. We'll do what we need to do. Uh, we want to impress you all. And they definitely did that. That is for sure. So uh, did that. Got to walk around Seattle. Beautiful city. Really happy. Really excited to see it. Um, had a lot of fun there. Had a lot of fun on the trip. I'm exhausted. I'm not going to lie. Came back and... Uh, my son's not sleeping well, so uh, I think we got three hours of sleep last night when I got back. Um, I landed at 5.45 in the morning. I was supposed to go to an audition at 10 a.m. Uh, for a commercial, and I'm not going to lie to you, I may have missed it, and I was worried because a lot of you know that I, or might know that I recently signed with a talent agency, um, and my agent called me and was like, why'd you miss? And I was like, honestly, I just didn't even hear my alarm. I was bushed, man. Um, I didn't get to bed till probably about 7 o'clock because I was taking care of my kid. And uh, he said, don't worry about it. And they got me another audition for tomorrow. So uh, I, I was sad that I missed it. Really felt terrible. And now I got another one. So no big deal. That said, though, I uh, that's pretty much it. That's my TI experience. I think that it was very, very good. I think that there are some things that Valve could improve on. I think that Press may be someone to talk to next year. I still stand by the LD blog that he released before the invites that... Uh, it was crazy to me that the VIPs, that there wasn't VIP access given to things like content creators on uh, community members, people who do a lot of good stuff. Oh, I should also mention I did go to the 82L uh, meetup and met up the .p guys as well as the 82L guys. Um, had a lot of fun there. Nice to meet all of them. I got to hang out with Gorgon in person for a while. So it was really cool to sort of meet the people that I know and work with. Um, outside of the internet like we've skyped so many times but seeing them in person is a much different vibe and, uh, and a lot of fun i also got told that i am a lot bigger than people think i am uh pretty much constantly so that was interesting all right let's talk about any questions if you got questions you want me to answer throw them into chat right now uh Widex wants to know why was nahas taken off the panel do people not like him i don't think so i think that he did a great job um i Think that they tried to spread it out through all the analysts. They had a lot of talent there that they weren't utilizing. Um, Pyrian Flax is a great example. They brought him out, they paid for him to be there, and then he did almost nothing the entire time uh, except jumped on a couple of panels. And I think that maybe Valve, from a production standpoint, keep in mind, from what I understand, ESPN produced this, not Valve itself. Um, they missed a little bit of a train. In, in a couple of ways. A, they had a hot bid and Sir Action Slacks on site working for them doing interviews and they didn't show any of them. They didn't show any of them on the stream. They put them all on the media channel. I think that that's a little bit of a failure. Um, 
because that's good content. Yes, it doesn't fit the ESPN look, but it's stuff that we love. And especially during those pauses, the DDoS on the early days, um, when Casey had to run around and try to fill space, like it would have been nice to have some packages pre-prepared to put up in that situation. That said, the first two days, I felt like the panels were very, very brain heavy, kind of like they were in the pre with Cho and the Merlinis, these brilliant analysts. Uh, and analysts are great, but it puts a lot of pressure on the host, right? When you've got three people who are geniuses about Dota, they're not really the most kind of passionate, gonna throw out their play host job. Uh, they're, not the, they're not hype men. And I think that that puts a lot of pressure on the host. Cho did a good job with it. Red Eye survived and did pretty well. Um, did a good job with it as well because the days were long. But on um, the panels where Shiva, where uh, Ted, where Period Flax, where Nahaz were on the panel, I felt like they ran smoother because those guys know their stuff for the most part, but they also really love Dota and they're excited to always sort of jump in and talk. And I think that that's a necessity because it allows the host to host while someone else takes care of the hype and then the two remaining analysts take care of the brains. And that's a really good vibe. Why they didn't do that more, I don't know, but I feel like as it pushed on, they did get better and better at that. Shiver uh, made a lot more appearances on the panel. I think she does a very good job with that sort of bridge between host and analysts. Um, I also think that they bumped Nahaz a few times for players. Because uh, I know like Kyle and Bulba and some others were all on there. Um, and they did a great job. And it's just someone's got to get bumped. I think that was the most logical choice in that situation. Let's see. All right, Kalagai was there. He was not used. I already wasn't used in the late stages. Gods was done by the end of the, by the time it started. So there was just a lot of a lot of talent they were trying to shift in. I think is is the point to make. Go, good point, JF Eggs. Uh, let's see. Which team underperformed the most based on both the expectations and seeding from the group stage? I mean, I think that the answer to that one is probably Cloud Nine. I I love the guys. I think that they. Could have had a bright future. I don't know if they'll still stay together after all of this. Um, I think they had a tough draw, but I think that they were really a big letdown. Everyone expected Newbie to do badly. I think a lot of folks, I had C9 finishing in the top five in my compendium. Um, and when they were out so early, it was, it was definitely depressing uh, to see a team that has traditionally finished well. They're a team that we joke about finishing second, but honestly, they have more second place finishes than any other team out there. They're, their earnings, if you looked at the last year, was up in the top four. I mean, they never won, but they did well. And to see what happened in this TI is just kind of mind blowing. Um, let's see. Did I hear anything about Valve Majors? Uh, I heard some stuff, nothing's official. Valve is sort of keeping it hush hush. We do know that DAC is very likely going to be one. We know that ESL has their hands on one. Um, and it sounds like it'll be the first one, but I can, cannot verify that. The fact that ESL released their new doping policy stuff today does tell me that it's probably gonna be ESL major right out of the gate for fall. Uh, but again, we, 100% Valve is not confirming or telling us anything. Um, I have heard rumors, and uh, I think that it was said last Chuan uh, said it in his Twitter, um, but I've heard in other places as well that September 1st will be the deadline for signing new players. So if you are a team that wants to put a roster together, you have till September 1st to lock it in before majors uh, no longer allow you to bring that roster. I also heard rumors, and this is 100% speculation, uh, that roster sizes will be increased from five to seven. Um, I don't know if that's true, and I don't. I didn't really have a chance to sort of dig into it. Um, but if that that would make sense to me, if we're trying to put together roster locks, it, it's a necessity to have substitutes available. Uh, let's see. Am I going to invite some of EG's members to interview? I love your interviews. Thank you. I appreciate that, Tama Toma Toma Ruben. Uh, I will. I have an open standing invitation. I'll put it on the board right now to any EG member who wants to come on the show. We had PPD stop by once. Um, any of them are welcome. They all know that too. I've told Charlie many times. I will have them anytime that they want to be come by. Um, that said, EG is a quiet team, and a lot of folks. And this is a good transition. Talked about the lack of hype, hype when they won the Aegis. And let's be completely honest here. I expected the lack of hype. You know, these are guys who are cerebral in any, any every possible way. They're thinkers. Um, they're, I mean, there are jokes and memes about like, I almost got fear to smile in a picture. And that's true because he's a serious person. That's just the personalities that they have. And on top of that, I think they played eight games. I don't know, my math is bad, but that's a lot of Dota um, leading up to this. So you win, you're, you're, the adrenaline in that final game has to be insane. And just to like have it all come out, it's gotta be exhausting. So I don't at all fault the guys for not being overhyped about 
about winning. I think that they were, but I think that they were also just completely tired. There was a tweet that someone put out, I forgot who tweeted it, um, about Sumail being uh, sleeping on a table basically after the tournament ended. I think that, that about sums it up. Uh, let's see. Why is he so good looking? I don't know why uh, Matt is so good looking, other than he is just. He, he is, though. I can't argue it. The man is good looking. He's Him and Coddle guys just start some sort of good looking Dota podcast. Let's see. I am going to have lots of shows about TI and major shuffles. Um, I'm going to keep track of them as they come out. So basically, as the information drops, we'll start to let you know. And when big things are confirmed, then I'm going to actually try to get panels together to talk about those changes or those official things to kind of give us insight on them. So yes, I'll keep you updated at least once a week, and we'll try to get some more stuff put together as it pushes forward. Don't expect a lot of interviews this week because the players are going to be lambasted with offers and discussions and negotiations. They're recovering from a very long training period. So my heart actually goes out to these guys. Uh, you know, the last two months was hard. The last week was insane. And then now they have to uh, get it all put together and make decisions that are going to change their life in less than 20 days. And that's that's got to be pretty gosh darn stressful. Could I spitball a timeline, in my opinion, when we get something like esports? center on a mainstream media do we need to um dj wheat did a really good job of talking about this so cnn interviewed him if you didn't see it you can go find it really easily um about dota 2 and esports and stuff and they asked him do you think that esports needs to be on tv to be accepted or like do you think that esports needs to be on tv and his response and this is absolutely right is we don't need to be on tv we just need acceptance and i think that that's 100 percent true TV is a dying media. Why do I want my esports on SportsCenter? Something like 70% of fans of esports consume through the internet anyway. So what is the point of us getting on SportsCenter? Why not have shows on the internet that, that cater to you? We just need people to accept that. We need when I'm on the street and I say, hey, hey Toffees, what do you like to do? Uh, I say, well, I do a podcast about Dota. I cover the competitive scene. You do what with a video game? Like that's the kind of thing we need to fix. We need people to be like, oh, that's cool. If I walked around and people said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I uh, do play-by-play -play for the local football team. They go, wow, that's a fun hobby. If you say it about Dota, they give you a funny look. I think that that's the problem is that the mainstream needs to accept it, that it's real, that it's something that's happening, that we're a big community, um, but we don't need to be on the networks. Let's see. So uh, as far as the timeline goes, Meta, I don't think there is a timeline. I think that they're going to start putting us on there because they have to. Uh, but I think that we will go off on our own. And, um, you know, if there was an eSports network on TV, I think it would do okay. Uh, and I would, if, if the numbers stand, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens in two years. But I don't know how successful that will be. Let's see. How can Valve the community work to help players who are either new or transferring from other MOBAs like LOL or HOD uh, make a better tutorial? Otherwise, they can go F themselves. All right, listen, there's plenty of community members who have worked their butts off from the get-go uh, to learn this game. We give you all the heroes for free. We give you all the tutorials for free. We give you everything you need, including the game for free. Suck it up and learn to play. I'm not going to give you shit. All right. Do I think any top teens will or should skip the first major? Uh, I think there'll be some teams that are forced to skip the first major because you guys saw the 2P article that came out. There is a bit rumor mongering about Korean, sorry, uh, I'm a little, still recovering a little bit sick. Korean uh, sponsors and teams coming over looking for teams, looking for players. I think there's going to be a lot of that. I don't think it may be Korean. I think it might have been a little bit uh, preemptive, but I know there are some teams hunting. And I think that some of the established teams are going to find themselves with rosters that they were not expecting at the end of this week. And... Um, it would not surprise me to see some of the larger organizations have to take a step back on the first major. I'm not going to say who yet, but I'm not going to be surprised if it happens. Uh, would that exempt them? What do you think Dota 2 needs to be in order to grow in a healthy way? I mean, what do I think Dota needs to grow in a healthy way? I think that it's growing just fine, honestly. I think that the major system and roster locks are the next big step. It'll buy buy-in from fans. We'll have a team that you can buy merchandise for i know it's not going to change constantly um i hear rumors you will you will once you roster lock you won't have to stay with that team forever but you'll have to you will have a limited number of switches you can do throughout the year between majors so once you have your seven you'll be allowed to switch out. i think it's two uh 
players for different reasons, but you have to keep the majority of your roster intact. So again, this is all rumor. We'll know more as it comes out, uh, but that's what I have in play for now. So guys, that's about all the time that I have put to the side for us to talk about TI uh, tonight. I'm sure you'll get more. I've already tracking the trades and stuff going on. Um, I think we'll have some really good stuff coming out soon. Keep your eyes to the screens because we're going to get a lot of great information. And I will, of course, be covering it here live on Coffee with Toffees whenever something big happens, as well as you know throughout the week with the show in general. Um, if you have ideas for shows, future podcasts, things like that, you can always email me at 5 gaming at gmail.com. I'm always interested in hearing it. And of course, if you want to work with me, if you are interested in writing for the show, if you're interested in creating video content for the show, if you're interested in creating overlays or a new music intro, or anything at all fans and people who watch this are what made this show a success honestly uh, when we go back to how it started out it was a real crappy looking show uh, but everything that you see was made by people who enjoyed it so if there's something you want to contribute please email me let me know I'd love to include you um, if it involves crediting you for overlays or something like that 100% totally open to doing that if you want to support the show you go to patreon.com slash toffees uh, underscore Dota 2, and that is a way to directly donate to keep the show going. A lot of folks, I think we had 100, about 100 to 120 bucks a month that comes in, and almost all of those are $1 donations. So it's just a place where if you like the show, if you want to help me keep it going on the months when I can't find sponsors, which is a lot of months to be honest with you, um, that dollar helps. It goes to paying for hosting, it goes to paying for SoundCloud and podcast analysts and all that crazy stuff that kind of has to be done to run the show. Um, so that is, I think, pretty much it, guys. Next show should be uh, Thursday if I stay on track, and I'm going to see if I can't get somebody to come on and chat a little bit. I do know that I'm set, I have Fluff and Stuff on to talk about Root Gaming and his uh, his move towards post TI. We've got some other folks lined up as well, so make sure you check back. Follow me on Twitter at Toffees underscore Dota 2 for updates on the show as well as uh, what content is coming and relevant updates throughout the week. Um, that's pretty much it, guys. So thanks for watching. Thanks to Razor and Betway for supporting the show and keeping us going. It was wonderful spending the evening with you guys. Come back and see me soon. If you have more questions, you can tweet them at me. I would love to actually, if you have questions I didn't answer, tweet them at Toffees underscore Dota 2. Or if you really want to, I have a uh, Ask FM. It's Ask FM Toffees underscore Dota 2. I check that all the time as well. So you can ask me either of those. Uh, tweet might be more fun because then we can actually go back and forth. So tweet me your questions. I'll answer them as best I can. But for now, I got to get my son to bed and I'll see if I can't get a game in before I go to sleep myself. So have a wonderful evening. Play more Dota. And as always, my friends, Toffees out.